Okay, I think it's time. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, um, it's another of our Thursday uh, colloquium, Sadayuka. And um, we started uh, in April last year. Um, and then we thought this online medium is actually quite, quite suits us because we can get great speakers to talk to us from all over the world. And you can watch our hairs grow as, as, um, as we are locked down from time to time. Um, we are very fortunate to have um, today uh, Professor Oliver Hahn um, to give um, uh, today's colloquium. Uh, Professor Hahn is uh, Chair of uh, Data Sciences in Astronomy astrophysics in at the University of uh, uh, Vienna. Uh, he did his PhD from ETH Zurich, then went um, to spend time as a postdoctoral fellow in, in Stanford and, and ETH, and then was at the Observatory of Nice, um, and um, has joined um, the uh, a completely new department, which is the interface between mathematics and the Department of Earth Sciences and Astrophysics at the University of Vienna. And you can see more and more of such interfaces being explored because data science is becoming so important in astrophysics right now. And where else can we see this uh, interface work so well as in large scale simulations of, uh, of large scale structure in cosmology? So um, over to you, Oliver, for the talk on cosmology at the interface of numerical techniques. Bye. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be back at Ayuka, but not being back really. So I guess that's always the downside of giving these <laughs> seminars remotely that one, one is, uh, doesn't have the benefits of being there uh, locally. I, I, I vividly remember visiting Asim, uh, which just said it was, must have been four years ago and sitting in the, the court of Ayuka, drinking tea and discussing with everyone, which was a wonderful time. And I hope we'll, we'll come back to that such normal, to normality uh, once again, hopefully not too many months. Yes, so uh, uh, I will talk about um, cosmology, especially uh, large-scale structure, um, at the interface of numerical and analytical techniques, as the as the title says, and that tries to do a little bit justice, it did, <laughs> to, to this cross appointment between astrophysics and mathematics uh, that I um, that I just recently took up at the University of Vienna, and um, so I will be talking um, a little bit. Uh, at a, a sort of a somewhat new topic for me because um, I, I, when I met Asim uh, ten years ago, we I was only doing simulations, and I think he was he was mostly doing uh, analytical calculations. And now it, maybe it has almost reversed that he's doing many many simulations, and I'm I'm doing more perturbation theory. So that's funny how time goes. So um, I will talk a little bit about something that we've been up to recently which is um, uh, the, at the, the work at the interface of, of perturbation theory and uh, cosmological simulations. And so why is this interesting? I hope I'll, 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 hope I'll be able to convey that in the introduction, but what, what's really happening there is that we, we have sort of the, the small fluctuation uh, early phase of structure formation, which, which can be rigorously dealt with in a perturbative setting. So basically uh, it's linear plus small, small corrections. And the, the deeply nonlinear regime of the, of the uh, large scale structure um, where we have all the galaxies forming, we have all the baryonic physics that you've seen in the, in the movie. Let me maybe just put it back on. This is from, from the movie that my PhD student, Alison, uh, made from one of the simulations. And so this is, of course, the end stage of, of, of these, these simulations where we form the large scale structures. And, and we've all seen uh, talks of, of all these beautiful new simulations that, that capture everything from the formation of stars to black holes, uh, capture all these, these gas uh, recycling processes, feedback processes that go into such simulations. But that's not at all what I will be talking about, a sort of more dry <laughs> topic maybe. Um, and that, why is it interesting? Um, so one of the, the things that we're facing really with this, this new upcoming, already ongoing, I mean, it was the dark energy survey, um, uh, data release, uh, three three year um, data release, just just uh, I believe this week. Um, that we're really in this this uh, what's called the precision cosmology phase, where we have to be able to to rigorously predict, given a set of cosmological parameters, we have to be rigorously be able to predict um, the large scale structure up to certain scales, and um, 
this has been driven a lot by by body simulations, but there's always this sort of in between, and and the the accuracy that is required in order to get the maximum out is really quite challenging because we're really talking about one percent accuracy. And so when I started doing in body simulations, one was one uh, percent uh, was sort of unheard of. But now, really, when you when you plot sort of uh, summary statistics results. Now we're really aiming for, for percent level differences. And at that level, really everything matters. And so everything has to be revisited. So I'll talk about three aspects of this. So the first will be, the first aspect will be sort of give a little bit of an introduction to perturbation theory in this, this context is specifically Lagrangian perturbation theory. So that draws on work recently done with Cornelius Rumpf, who's a postdoc here in Vienna with me, and we're all fresh in Nice. And so here, one question we've been addressing lately is um, how far can we push perturbation theory? When does it cease to be valid? Um, how far can you go? Where does it break down? Uh, before I go sort of to the second aspect of once we have such a, uh, sort of a more rigorous understanding of perturbation theory and its convergence, um, how can we connect this with these questions of uh, precision cosmology? So one question here is, is, is how far in, in the order of perturbative schemes do we have to go? What are all the systematic effects? What are the errors that we're expecting? How do they show up? This is work um, that was mostly done by my uh, PhD student, uh, Michael Michaud, in terms of the analysis, again, with Cornelius Rumpf and uh, Raul Angulo was also helping with this. Before then, I, I will turn to the last uh, part which is sort of a new take on, on perturbation theory, where before sort of Lagrangian perturbation theory, as you will understand, will be about moving fluid elements or moving particles around, and perturbing their positions. And so what we're trying to do here is bringing it back to the field level. So field meaning something like a density field or a velocity field, um, which, which um, is, is, to my knowledge, uh, this, this method has been invented before, but it's not been uh, used at all, and so we've been investing a lot of time and uh, effort in this. This is work uh, that's been done in collaboration with Cora Ullemann, Cornelius Ramfrigan, Matteo Gosenza, and Natalia Porqueres, mostly. Okay, so what we're trying to do uh, for all the non-cosmologists uh, in the audience, uh, for everyone else, uh, this, this might be a little bit boring, of course, is to predict the entire history of the universe from first principles. So uh, given, in, in essence, uh, an inflationary model, we have the, the, the very well studied phase of the uh, early plasma um, with, the, with the minutes uh, fluctuations get, that give rise to the uh, density uh, troughs and, and little wiggles in there, which gives the metric perturbations, which then give rise to temperature fluctuations that can be observed as a one in 10 to the five uh, fluctuations in the, in the cosmic microwave background, uh, an isotropy. And um, these, these uh, metric perturbations then grow to, to attract uh, matter, uh, which, which in, in by uh, today or uh, over the sort of the 10 giga years since then, form the large scale structure. So here what you see is a, a full sky map from the two mass surveys, so each dot here is a galaxy. You see also that these, these galaxies are not randomly, and so they contain information. And if we zoom in, then of course, we ultimately also have to understand the nature of these traces that we use in order to make this connection between the early universe and the late universe. And so uh, everyone who's been following this a little bit, there has been a lot of talk about tensions between what has been uh, measured in the early universe, uh, earlier universe, and uh, things that have been measured in the late universe. And so you see that the, there's a lot of potential for discovery of, of, of new physics, but there is also um, an incredible amount of uh, rigor needed in order to understand all the systematics and, and make very accurate predictions. And so in the end, uh, a lot of these predictions, if not um, all, uh, really uh, rely, of the nonlinear neurons, uh, really rely on, on, on supercomputers. But what I will try to say today is that that's still with, um, with perturbation theory, well, some people will, will of course uh, disagree with me <laughs> uh, and, 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 and say, well, we can do a lot more than, than uh, with perturbation theory. But typically I think the field has been pushed uh, really by, by, uh, by computer simulations uh, and not so much by, by perturbation theory. So I will, I will try to talk a little bit where these things come together. So the, the, the galaxy distribution in the end is, is sort of the, the main target that we'll, we'll look at. And, and so it was very nice, of course, that, that uh, Jim Beebles 
in fact, got the Nobel Prize for his pioneering work in, in using the uh, galaxy distribution as a, as a cosmological probe. And uh, so this is a very old field that has matured, uh, very old in that field that uh, began way before I at least uh, entered this field of, of, of cosmology uh, in, in, the, in the 80s uh, with the first surveys. And then to the F, we started having these this, this, um, sort of more and more complete maps of the galaxy distribution up to the two Mars survey. And of course, you know, all the upcoming uh, galaxy surveys that will map basically all galaxies out to very high redshift across most of the sky. So um, the distribution of the galaxies um, reflects, of course, um, both sort of the, the, the early universe physics, because this uh, gives rise to the perturbations, which then collapse uh, to form the galaxies. Um, but it also reflects all the later time physics of the universe. So the, the um, dark energy, uh, but there's also neutrino impacts. So when do neutrinos exactly become non-relativistic? And all these kind of questions leave imprints in, in the large-scale structure. And so large-scale structure, in fact, is a is a very sensitive cosmological probe, and there are multiple ways to exploit this. So if we if we have the sort of the power spectrum that quantifies in a, in a more rigorous way instead of these maps, the fluctuations in the in the cosmic microwave background, then these these wiggles that we see here. Um, are in fact transported uh, to enhanced correlations that can be seen also in the galaxy distribution. And that is one of the very popular standard rulers used in large scale structure, the barium acoustic oscillation peak. Uh, at the same time, we of course have also things like galaxy cluster abundance that can be used to probe structure formation and cosmology. So large scale structure uh, in some sense, reflect is very complement, highly complementary to this uh, early universe picture of that we have now from from Planck and other CMB experiments by probing both uh, the nature of gravity, late time expansion, late time physics uh, in the universe, and bringing everything together. So, um, what information exactly is contained? So, I already showed. Let me just go back here. Um, I already showed sort of this is a correlation function. Here we sort of have a power spectrum. So uh, because in cosmology, at first order, everything is a Gaussian random field. Um, the power spectrum is the, the uh, quantity. The two-point function is the quantity of interest. And so in fact, in uh, the simplest, uh, simplest inflationary models in a very early phase of the universe, um, this, this correlation function of, of density delta is the density contrast. So uh, has a mean itself of zero and is divided by the mean density. Um, has, a, has a very simple uh, power law spectrum with an exponent, which is just a tiny little bit smaller than one. That's a rigorous prediction of, of, of inflationary models. Then you can have all kinds of uh, complications, of course. And uh, this primordial you produced uh, from quantum uh, fluctuations, which are stressed, stretched to, to macroscopic scales. This gets then uh, processed. Um, k, is, k is the wave number, so a large k is a small scale, uh, a small k is a large scale. So it's the amplitude in some sense of fluctuations on a given scale. This gets pro processed uh, by some, some uh, transfer function. And so what is in essence happens is what can be calculated at linear order uh, because these fluctuations are small by what's called linear Boltzmann solvers. This is what's done in essence in, in, in this analysis of, of CMB uh, perturbations, CMB fluctuations. So one, one evolves a multi-species fluid of dark matter, baryons, photons, neutrinos, all coupled at linear order to general relativity and evolved then as a set of uh, ordinary differential equations. And in essence, what comes out, so what we have here is a co-moving wave number. So again, here we have large scales, here we have small scales. And this is this amplitude of the um, of this transfer function. So in some sense, we get an evolution of, of the horizon scale. Um, that's sort of the causally connected regions in the universe that get increasingly larger over time. And we have a phase which we call the uh, radiation dominated. So that's because uh, relativistic uh, species scale with the fourth in inverse of the fourth power so they grow rapidly in the early universe while non-relativistic matter or dust grows only with the third power. So in the early universe, we're always dominated by relativistic particles. And so on large scales, um, um, only, only super at, at, during the radiation domination epoch, only these, these super horizon scales grow while these sub 
horizon scales or small scales are frozen in. And then as we enter matter radiation domination, uh, all scales start to grow. You see here now the distance between these curves uh, is the same. So we go here from redshift uh, 200,000 to redshift 20. And so the you get this characteristic scale imprinted in the fluctuations. And if you look very closely, you see here also these small wiggles, which start to be imprinted uh, below of a uh, redshift of about a thousand, which is these baryon acoustic oscillations, which come from um, uh, a tight coupling of photons and baryons uh, in, in the plasma phase. And so the interesting in these models is uh, that this is, of course, we're by definition, we're only using a linearized equation. So we have no coupling of scales. And that means uh, that all information is preserved, right? In this case, any scale never talks to any other scale. And so if you have any linear evolution, all information on a given scale is never mixed with any other scale and therefore is preserved. And um, so the whole shape of this, as you've maybe saw from this, contains now information about when exactly this radiation domination to matter rate domination uh, transition occurs. Uh, it contains information about uh, the coupling between baryons and photons and in this uh, baryon acoustic oscillation. So all this is sort of information that, that is imprinted at the early phase and then transported into the galaxy uh, distribution. And so when we, when we set up simulations, what we're doing is uh, we always start with this, this, this linear full physics phase where we include as many uh, components as possible. We make a specific realization of a n-body universe or whatever your favorite method of simulation is, which um, is ideally somewhat close to isotropic and homogeneous, but we of course have to have a size of a simulation box and we have a resolution scale. And so in some sense, these things are always a little bit broken. And then we piece them together um, using um, perturbation, an additional Lagrangian perturbation theory that we'll talk about in a moment. We run the simulation and we get out the summary statistics, for example, the power spectrum for three point statistics uh, about the galaxy distribution or the matter distribution if we're interested in lensing and so on. So, an important uh, ingredient um, that I will I will get to is when we when we now go to Lagrangian perturbation theory. And I try to give you a little bit of a uh, you know what what what's going into this. I'm not going into all detail, but just to give you the idea, uh, a very important uh, limit that we have to take is the the cold limit. Um, you might wonder why that is. Um, it it essentially means that we can describe everything all degrees of freedom we have in terms of one single scale of degree of freedom. Um, so meaning, what, do, what does that mean? So if we have a warm distribution function, so here we have a phase space, we have position and we have a velocity. And this is the distribution of my particles. So I have more particles where it's orange, I have fewer where it's, where it's uh, light blue and uh, where most particles sit on this black line. So it's kind of, uh, if I've made to cut here, it would look like something like this. So I have a sort of a close to a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, Gaussian in the velocity space. The cold limit now means I go in this to a single velocity, uh, which reduces this to a pure line. And if it is a pure line, um, then, of course, I have exactly one velocity at every point. And um, if this, this velocity uh, is, changes smoothly from one point to the next, I can write this as a gradient of some kind of potential. And I only have a, grade, I only have a scalar degree of freedom if this is a potential field, uh, if you want. And so this is a very essential ingredient uh, that we will get to in the moment. So the, the key is that we only have this phi, which describes everything. And then uh, the evolution, of course, can become uh, more complicated. But this is what we mean by the cold limit that we have, uh, at least at early times, we have exactly one velocity or one momentum at every, every point, right? So now this can be, of course, uh, sort of uh, more irregular than this perturbation here, but this is, this is the main essence. The key now is if we, if we develop this, um, our Boltzmann equations into the moments as you, I'm, I'm, uh, you might have heard in, in, in your uh, uh, kinetic theory lectures. So the density, if F is this distribution that we have here in phase space, so it's sort of this density in this two-dimensional space or six-dimensional if we go to 3D, then the density comes just by integrating over this, uh, the, the momentum, uh, integrating out the momentum degrees of freedom. We can get the mean momentum by taking by integrating, taking the first moment uh, with respect to the momentum dis distribution and the second by taking the tensor 
product between the momentum and so on. So what we get, uh, if you remember your kinetic theory lectures, is we get this infinite hierarchy of equations. And so in the cold limit, uh, we see immediately that, now if you remember statistics, that this is sort of trivial. Uh, because it's cold, this has no sort of intrinsic component. It doesn't have a connected part, uh, if you want, in a statistical sense. And it can be completely expressed in terms of this. And so until um, at late times, when things get more complicated, I'll explain this in a moment, what we call shell crossing, in fact, this, this hierarchy is completely truncated here. So there is, in fact, a mathematical uh, rigorous argument to be made about this, which is called the Marcinkiewicz theorem. In fact, there is only exactly two kinds of distribution functions for which such an expansion is finite. And that is uh, the, exactly the one which is truncated here, in which case we have a, a delta Dirac distribution. So that's, that's here, that's the delta Dirac. Or it's specified by two degrees of freedom. So we also have this one here. Um, and then all others are, are zero. This is then uh, a Maxwell Boltzmann, which in general can be also uh, an isotropic. And so, uh, in fact, uh, what this means in the cold limit, um, as long as it is remains cold, uh, you might not be able to guarantee that for all times, but uh, that's something we leave to worry for now for the mathematicians. So um, then for at least short times, we can write it like this with this pressure uh, essentially to zero when we have exactly one velocity, what we call uh, monokinetic. So we get the fluid equations, in fact, are the exact solution for such a system up to some time when this uh, breaks down. Okay, so you can set the pressure here, uh, in fact, exactly to zero. And this is the exact set of equations of so a continuity equation and an Euler equation, which is only sourced by, by gravity. That's the equations we're talking about. So now what is Lagrangian perturbation theory? Uh, Lagrangian perturbation theory is now, instead of uh, describing um, the fluid in terms of a density and the velocity, we follow trajectories. So we say uh, a fluid element initially located at Q moves, evolves to some patch of fluid that's at some position X. And we write this as something at X came from Q and has been displaced by some function, which is only a function of Q. And then the density, um, in fact, is given by the Jacobian of this mapping. So if you, if you want to say, think of it, it's just a coordinate transformation that I make here. And if I make a sort of, if I have a volume integral and I want to preserve the mass that's here under such a coordinate transformation, then the Jacobian enters naturally. And it turns out that the density is just one over the, the Jacobian, uh, essentially, of this, of this mapping. So uh, we, we can write down an exact connection between such a, um, a map, what we call the Lagrangian map, between, between this undeformed fluid element and the deformed fluid element and get a density out. So now uh, all we have to do, of course, is uh, put this density back. So if we have, these are now the equations of motion. So the acceleration of a particle is given by the gradient of the potential. And then we have here a Hubble drag term that comes from the expansion of the universe. And we have a Poisson equation, which sources back uh, the density contrast. And so I, I will not bore you here with the details, but this can be all combined into this master equation of Lagrangian perturbation theory, which essentially just now we replace here this delta with the Jacobian, insert everything, and we get this master equation out. So what the perturbation theory says is, let's develop this displacement map in terms of sort of a time function, just think of this as time, so a time to a power of n, and then we have these different coefficients, and so this is just the Taylor series in time. And so this is this has been studied, um, well, the, the first order, I will give you more uh, intuition for this shortly, uh, not bore you more with these mathematical details. The first uh, uh, order of this, of this theory, in fact, has been guessed without a to my knowledge, a rigorous uh, derivation by Zeldovich already in the, in the late 60s, so 69, 1970, uh, is a famous paper by, by, by Zeldovich on the Zeldovich approximation, which is the n equals one case. And then um, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, uh, the second and third orders came, came along um, by, by Thomas Buchert, uh, Paolo Catalan, uh, uh, Freddy Boucher, until very recently, uh, in fact, all the recursion relations uh, have, have been um, derived from this equation where essentially if you know psi at n, uh, you can calculate psi at n plus one. 
uh, and this has been studied by, by, by uh, various authors since then. And we'll make use, in fact, of this uh, shortly. So what is the Seldovich approximation? So if we look at this map uh, at first order, so then, then at first order, we just get straight lines, right? So what turns out, this, this degree of freedom that we have, the scalar degree of freedom, just appears as a gradient. And the map just looks like we start at Q, then we have some sort of constant displacement term, and we have a time factor. So what, 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 what does this mean? So you can think of this as um, a, a phenomenon that's very similar, that this goes back to an analogy, in fact, by, by, which was published first by to my knowledge, Sildovich and uh, Sergei Shandarin in about 89 or so, uh, where uh, if you look at the bottom of a swimming pool, it's in fact exactly the same phenomenon. So you have a, a, a perturbed surface, which gives a random deflections to infalling light rays. So this gives you this, 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 this perturbation here. And then the depth is just uh, corresponding to this time coordinate. And so as you, as you go here now, these, these light rays, they will, at different times, they will intersect. So here they come in, in, uh, in parallel, then they are deflected. So shortly after, uh, for, for short times, it will be very close to this situation. But then as you go, uh, if, as you lower the bottom of, the, of your swimming pool, you start seeing intersecting light rays and they, they give rise to this pattern, which in fact is very similar to a two-dimensional uh, Zaldovich uh, um, simulation of the universe. And so, in fact, uh, this has been known for a long time. So this goes, this is one of the first uh, non-n-body simulations, if you want, uh, that shows the large scale structure emerging from, from the Zaldovich uh, simulation by uh, Doroshkevich, Kotok, and Shandar in 1977, a Russian group. Um, and so what you see here already is, is just from, from sort of this one scalar uh, field, a degree of freedom of, of, a, of a displacement potential, you get out uh, this, this large scale structure, filaments and clusters and void regions and so on. Um, where they come from, um, that is just connected to, to the Jacobian. So remember the Jacobian is just uh, the derivative of this X coordinate with respect to the um, original position. And so if you place this, uh, take the Jacobian of this map here, uh, we get, of course, here uh, a delta uh, a Kronecker uh, uh, Dirac here, and um, the second derivative of this um, of this of this potential here. And so, if we think of uh, the eigenvalues, then then this thing here is just the product of one minus uh, time times this lambda. And so, if lambda is is three times uh, something positive, then this 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 will become negative. And since in the density it appears here as one over, it will become infinite. So we have infinities whenever. Um, this is a positive a finite value. And so we can, if we have uh, two positive eigenvalues in the 2D case, then we'll form a cluster while if, and so on. So, you know, uh, maybe you've heard about this connection between, um, between um, these, these eigenvalue structures already and the different structures. So we get essentially in 3D, we have four possible structures from the eigenvalues, voids, pancake-like structures, planar filaments, and uh, clusters. And this has been uh, in the 80s uh, studied. Uh, there's an interesting uh, connection to catastrophe singularity theory in, in mathematics. Unfortunately, one doesn't learn very much because this is only the, the lowest order. So uh, as we get close, of course, to when these singularities appear, um, we might need higher order corrections. So that's something that's unclear. So, uh, and then this becomes much more complicated, these maps and so on. So, what happens over time, if we go back to, to the 1D, so we have sort of straight lines which propagate to the right, and the angle is now this, this, this gradient in some sense that, that, that is perturbed. And because this is perturbed at some time, they will intersect wherever the, the eigenvalue is uh, indicating that they are being focused, and they will not intersect where the eigenvalue would indicate that they are being stretched. And so if we look at a single perturbation like this sine wave that we had before in phase space, it corresponds to a situation like this. And then there's a definite moment when for the first time um, these, these, these trajectories cross, and this crossing is in fact exactly when this Jacobian uh, becomes zero and therefore the density becomes infinite. And afterwards the trajectories cross and we form a collapsed virilized structure. So in 1D here, this is time, and this is this X coordinate, this looks something like this. So we have here the regime where this hasn't happened yet, and then we have the the, the very different uh, nonlinear regime afterwards. So 
what we typically say is before we have the monokinetic regime, and this is accessible to perturbative uh, techniques because we have this very simple truncation of the cold, in the cold limit, while after the shell crossing happens in what's called the multi-kinetic regime, and then we have here our distribution function now is no longer simple, and we have the full Boltzmann hierarchy. We cannot guarantee um, that there's any simple uh, closure of the, of the Boltzmann hierarchy that would allow us. Uh, people have tried, people have played around which such closures or effective models and so on, but um, it gets messy at this point. So here we have to go and for now trust uh, simulations. And now if you extend this picture to 2D, then uh, at early times it would look something like this, but then uh, your trajectory starts sort of folding up and start building up this 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 picture of, of these singular structures in uh, phase space. Uh, sorry, in, in the universe. So the question, uh, one, one mathematically interesting uh, question, uh, but also for the reliability of this uh, is if we now go back to, okay, so we understand um, at first order these are straight lines. And then if we go to higher order now, they stand, H1 starts being a parabola or starts being a third order curve in time and so on. So, so we can get arbitrarily complex uh, uh, trajectories uh, out of this because we, we, we go to infinite order here in this LPT expansion. So one question that in fact has never been really answered uh, for, for, for realistic initial uh, data for, for, for initial uh, perturbations is, does this even yield a, a convergent expansion and when does this break down, right? So we know that uh, in fact the equations break down when the shell crossing happens, but uh, can, does the, the, the expansion in fact uh, converge um, up to that point? Does it converge longer? Does it converge shorter? It's a question that has not been answered at all. And so typically, uh, before, people were always thinking, well, we have to use this uh, at early times, right? Like our perturbation theory. We were in the perturbative regime, so we have to, we should stay away from the shell crossing to be on the safe side and let simulations do the things uh, when, when it gets complicated. So now what I want to convey is that maybe that's not exactly the picture we should be thinking about. So if you think about what is, if you now maybe remember your mathematics lectures, so this is a Taylor series, uh, when does it converge? Well, there is at some point, uh, so we have, a, uh, we have to think of this as a complex series. This is, if you think back to mathematics, not really relevant for this, but just get to have a, the general picture we have. So if you complexify then this time, this D, uh, then you have an imaginary axis, a real axis, and then typically uh, you have a convergence limiting singularity somewhere in your complex plane and you have uh, a convergence radius uh, in, inside of which your, your series converges and outside it doesn't. Right? And so uh, this, this, uh, this radius of convergence of, 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 of Lagrangian perturbations here in fact has never been uh, determined uh, for, for general uh, data. It's, con it's, it's sort of been uh, for, for very simple single mode initial conditions and so on. Uh, this has been shown already a long time ago to be, uh, in fact, for a single mode in 1D, um, all orders n larger than one are zero. So that is uh, trivially uh, converged. Um, and for simple other cases, this has been studied before, but never for realistic uh, random initial conditions. So we set with Cornelius Jump, we recently set onto this. So one trick is first we take the norm of this displacement map. And then there's a very simple trick. Uh, in fact, if you have a conversion series, then the number of following coefficients have to decay in the right way. So uh, the, the ratio of, of the nth coefficient to the n minus one coefficient uh, in the limit of n to infinity gives you just one over the, um, one over the radius of convergence. Uh, this has simply to do that the, they have to decay um, fast enough so that, um, in, in fact, if you divide two terms by each other, right, you, you're left with 1d. Uh, if you divide the nth by the n minus 1, you're left with 1 over d. And um, so you get this, this, this ratio test simply out. So you can now plot this. Uh, the sequence of, of these, these, these ratios of these uh, coefficients. So here we see 1 over n. So here is n of infinity. And so if uh, subsequent coefficients of, of this displacement map form a nice line, which hits uh, this x-axis in a nice convergent way, then this intercept here at n to infinity by this definition of the ratio test gives you the time 
the maximum time until when this is this is true. So we just just did this. Uh, we implemented the full order recursion relations and computed these ratios. And so now for different spectra here, um, for example, uh, warm dark matter, uh, it doesn't matter for you, but essentially you have a spectrum of perturbations which is independent of the resolution of on which we make the realization uh, because it has a cutoff. So we see, in fact, yeah, we get very nicely a straight line which intercepts somewhere here around six, uh, D of six, so it corresponds roughly, um, because it's, this is, uh, sorry, this is one over D here, yeah? corresponds roughly to redshift six in this case. Uh, and then for CDM, uh, we have the more small scales we include, the earlier this, this happens. But so we always get out this asymptotic uh, nice regime. And in fact, when one looks when the shell crossing happens, because that can also be estimated from this, these times are always well, well after. So in fact, the, 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 the curious thing is that the perturbation theory works better than it should. So here, just to give you a feeling, this is how these coefficients look like over time. So this is the sort of this, this, this first order displacement map and then you go up in order. And then we see there are only a few points where this convergence is, is slow and the rest is very, very fast. And so these are uh, peculiar points we wanted to look at. We haven't done this yet, uh, study what exactly makes them converge a little bit slower uh, than other points. And so in fact, it turns out, so what you see here is power spectra um, of, of the 15th order to the 10th order. And so if you stay at shell crossing, in fact, you see that the 15th order is only a tiny, tiny correction to the 10th order. Uh, essentially, we have way, way, way of sub point, 0.1% accuracy. And then as you push it below, uh, you start you see that, that it starts to, to diverge. Um, and, and so this is very nice because this means now, in fact, we can use LPT at high enough order to push up to the moment when, when for the first time structures form. We don't have to restrict ourselves to this very, very, very early times uh, and have to leave this regime, in, this intermediate regime to n-body simulations. Uh, so it says soon public in monophonic code. Exactly. So this is all these, these all other recursion relations uh, will be public in fact soon. So if that's something that's uh, of interest also for your research, um, you, can, you can just get in touch or wait a little bit and it'll be public anyway. So when we go now to an n-body simulation, um, we, we do essentially the same. So we have again our Lagrangian map between this initial fluid element and the deformed one, but now we discretize. So instead of having this continuous uh, deformation of the square into this blob here, we, we uh, cut up uh, our, our initial volume, in the simplest case, into little cubes of the same volume, and we replace them with um, the, uh, the evolution of the characteristic um, of, of, of sort of the motion of the center of mass. And then uh, these particles uh, sort of sample uh, this blob uh, by, by just being uh, sort of a, a particle, a Monte Carlo realization of the distribution that we have uh, here in this blob. And uh, you can then derive uh, from the Vlasov uh, equation or Boltzmann equation, you can derive Hamiltonian equations of motion um, for, these, for these particles. So the key is, however, that we've broken the symmetry of the system right, by discretizing it. And so um, one problem of embodied simulations, in fact, is exactly that. So that we always, we have, a, we introduce discreteness, right? So typically um, we have to choose um, an initial embody universe, a particle universe, which uh, is isotropic and, and uh, homogeneous like our universe should be. But of course we have to break this at the discretization scale. So one choice is, is um, uh, to, to put the particles on a, on a simple uh, cubic uh, Bravais lattice. So that's just, we put them at the corner and then this is the unit cell and then we just replicate this. Uh, and so you make up your entire volume uh, with these little cells. And so it's clear when you average over sort of several cells, then, then it starts approaching something that's, that's uh, isotropic, but uh, locally, of course, uh, this, the symmetry is, is, is strongly broken. There are other ways of setting this up in, in different ways by making not uh, lattes, but more glass-like distribution and so on, but the essence doesn't change. So the problem here is that a particle that sits here, unlike a fluid element, which we know sort of has a isotropic and um, homogeneous uh, growth function, so meaning if I have a perturbation in any spatial direction, it will grow with the predicted rate of the fluid. Uh, in the case of a discrete uh, universe, I have 
directions which grow faster because I have a particle that's closer here, or I have ones which are slower, uh, uh, which would be, for example, on the space diagonal. So you can, you can in fact, formalize this by writing down uh, the perturbation theory for tetra lattice. This has been done by Michael Joyce and uh, Bruno Marcos uh, already uh, 15 years ago or so. So what you get out is that, in fact, for a particle uh, sits here, you have a deviation of the, of the, uh, from the fluid uh, growth uh, with which a perturbation should grow by about 30% up or down, depending on uh, which direction the perturbation goes. Right? So perturbation, which is aligned with, with the principal axis, the axis grows a little bit faster uh, than, than along the other axis. So what does this mean? Now, if I run a simulation and compare it to uh, a third order uh, perturbation theory calculation, then what I see is this dash line. In fact, I see a strong suppression of, of power, which comes from, uh, if you average over this, um, uh, spherically, because we are only plotting uh, uh, the modulus of the wave number, we see a strong suppression of power on, on small scales. And we reach a percent level only, only a factor of, uh, yeah, it's like a factor of four or so from the Nyquist particles. So it means I have in 3D, I have to average over four cubed particles before sort of I, I get isotropic. And um, um, in fact, uh, so what we, these are the dashed lines. And if we correct for the, for the, uh, for these, these linear order uh, undergrowth for, because of the discreteness, in fact, you see it's, it's all coming from exactly that. It's, it's, so it means that the, the end body system during the linear regime does not follow the fluid, but it follows um, a discrete system. And then um, it turns out, um, uh, well, this is only at, in, at very early times, so it means in some sense we, the end-body simulation does not track uh, your perturbations here as it should, but it tracks the discrete system. But maybe we're not really interested in that. What we want is uh, the, the, the much later time, redshift zero, uh, large-scale structure, very nonlinear, uh, much more nonlinear. And so it turns out, in fact, yeah, so uh, this is uh, um, the, the ratio of a power spectrum uh, with respect to one that's been oversampled with many more particles uh, like this, which, are, which is an axis which is way, way more isotropic uh, compared to this one. And so you see that, in fact, it catches up over time. And this has to do that most of the uh, growing perturbations are transporting large scale power to small scales. And so you're effectively, because of this transfer of power, because of collapse to small scales, uh, you're 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 being starting being um, shifting these arrows into collapsed structures and therefore they they disappear. Um, but at high redshifts and um, probably also uh, on, on on in sort of more under dense regions, this is clearly a problem. And it's also a a, a, a bigger problem, in fact, in, in if you go to higher order statistics uh, like the bispectrum. Um, so what you see here is, is that uh, the, the earlier you start your simulation, these are very busy plots. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go in full detail. I'll just give you, give you the gist. Is if you start at early times, uh, earlier times, this gets worse and worse. So if you, if you start your simulation earlier, in fact, it has more time to sort of relax to the, the evolution of the, of the discrete system and, and go away from the, from the continuous system with which, with whose perturbations you initialized it, and um, and it catches up a little bit at, at, at late times. And so, in fact, um, what we came up with is that it's much much better rather than saying I don't trust the perturbation theory and I run my simulation. I start very early to do exactly the opposite and go higher order in perturbation theory. This is the blue lines, and start as late as possible because then you sort of you set the system in the continuous fluid modes, and it hasn't time. To, to, to relax uh, into the into the discrete system uh, a lot before before really uh, collapse into into halos and, and nonlinear structure happens and for the bi spectrum in fact this is even more true where for low order perturbation theory um, uh, you, you you don't even uh, get this 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 right at the at the percent level really on on any scale uh, the same is also true for 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 halo mass functions and things like this uh, at the low mass and so this has been noted before, but um, this angle uh, of, of pushing to very late times for initializing the simulation is, is, is kind of new. And so um, just looking how I'm doing on time. Um, one thing that uh, um, um, 
we, we've been talking about in simulations now here, it's, it's, it's always particles. And uh, um, we, we have this beautiful perturbation here, which we can push into the, or close even further than shard processing regime. But this works only at the level of these Lagrangian fluid elements, which are essentially particles, which are things I, I can move around. So in some cases, this is not what I want. What I would like to do is get the fields back out. I would like to have the density field without having to have particles which are then project back onto the density field or have velocity fields, which are even worse. Because if I know the velocity of particles and I project the velocity of them, I have to divide by the density to get out the velocity field. But in regions where I don't have many particles, I divide by something which is very poorly sampled. So I have very, very poor uh, signal to noise and I'm, I'm essentially um, dividing by zero in the worst cases. Um, so it's also, I, I, for example, if I, if I have, use a finite volume uh, simulation code, um, um, uh, never mind this slide actually, let me go back to this one. <laughs> I'll skip that one. Uh, if you have a um, finite volume simulation code such as Enzo or Ramses or Nix or, or one of these codes, they don't work with particles. They work with having finite volumes on, on which you solve um, the Godinov, uh, uh, where you use essentially the Godinov method to, to, to evolve your fluid system. So you need to know um, the, the fields uh, on, on, on such a grid. And we didn't have any perturbation theory that works at the field level at the same, with the exact same power as this uh, Lagrangian perturbation theory. I didn't talk about the standard perturbation theory uh, because the standard perturbation theory um, put, works in put, perturbing the field, but it, it, it doesn't have these nice features that at already at first order I can go to infinite density, right? Because if I work at the field level and I, I work with perturbing, the, for example, the density, I have to, make sure that the density remains perturbative, meaning it remains a small quantity. While if I do Lagrangian perturbation theory, I have to make sure that the displacement sort of remains a small quantity. But even with a small displacement, I can produce uh, an infinite uh, density just by, by getting. So essentially a turn, and this was what Cornelius Rumpf always emphasizes <laughs> when he gives his talks, so I'm just stealing his argument. Essentially you're turning something that's infinite into something that becomes zero and therefore becomes perturbative. And, and, and so can we do this at the field level? Um, so let's go, let's go quickly back. Uh, so what we had is, is we have this, this Lagrangian map, which is our particles, and um, they start somewhere, they go somewhere. And at first order, these are straight lines. And then as we go into higher order, we add sort of a curvature component or an additional uh, time-dependent curvature and so on and so on. These are then the higher order corrections. So can we translate this uh, into something that's usable for Eulerian codes or uh, also for, for field levels. So if we, if, we, if we go back, this is the, the simulation result, and this is the first order um, LPD result. So these are just straight lines, but we get um, the shell crossing event, and we get sort of this multi-streaming after what's out. So how can we translate this to a field framework? Um, in the, this Seldovich approximation, in fact, uh, each particle, each fluid element, moves on a straight line between its coordinate Q at some time equals zero uh, to position X at some time equals A. So um, in some sense, what we would like to have is the transition amplitude for a fluid element to go from Q to X. So if we write down the classical action, then that's just uh, the distance between X minus Q times the velocity, the velocity of course is x minus q divided by the time, which is a, or a minus zero if you want, times one half. That's for a straight line, uh, the action, very simple to derive. If in, in more general cases, it's a bit more involved. And then all we do is now, um, let's express all this in terms of a, a wave function and apply the Feynman trick to get the propagator. So Feynman trick, I think actually goes back to the Dirac, not to Feynman is you take this classical action, you plug it in the exponent uh, with a prefactor i over h bar, you normalize this thing in such a way that if you let a go to zero here, this thing means this point must go to this one, so this thing must become a delta Dirac. And then um, this evolves, gives you the transition amplitude. You plug in some wave function defined in terms of q and out comes a wave function in terms of x, so some field transported essentially with this action. 
And then if you know Psi and you take, assume this is sort of an object like a standard wave function, you get back out a density, which is Psi Psi a complex conjugate, and you can get out a momentum density uh, flux um, um, from which you can get uh, velocity by dividing by rho. Uh, by taking a gradient of this field, you can also get higher moments. Uh, so this essentially now uh, makes uh, allows you to take moments by taking gradients of this, this field. So why does this work? In fact, uh, well, this is the sort of the physicist's uh, um, uh, explanation. But of course, as a fluid dynamicist, uh, there's a, a simple way. It write your wave function in terms of uh, an, an amplitude and a phase. And let's already uh, so presciently call the square root of rho. And here we have a phase, which is phi V. Then we plug this in. In fact, it turns this, trans this Schrodinger Poisson equation uh, which is equivalent to, to this free, um, this Schrodinger equation, which is uh, equivalent to this, this uh, free propagation problem that we had, into a continuity equation for uh, this, this amplitude. So you, you might have seen this in your quantum mechanics lectures, uh, where one shows that the, the probability flux, in fact, is a conserved quantity. Uh, but what you maybe have seen less is that for the phase, in fact, you get a Bernoulli equation, uh, this is then connected to Hamilton, Jacobi, and so on. And sometimes uh, you might have seen that as well. So this is, in fact, it, the Bernoulli equation, of course, is the Euler equation for potential flow with a quantum correction term, which um, has singularities in it, but we, we will see about this later. Uh, so this is, in fact, is exactly identical to the fluid cosmic fluid equations for irrotational uh, flows, for potential flow in the absence uh, at first order, uh, which is exactly the sort of which approximation, right? So uh, let me skip over the details. So if we, if we now uh, do the same game, so we have now, instead of our fluid trajectories, we have this psi, which has a phase and an amplitude, and we color here the, the phase with a color and the amplitude with uh, how, how white or how, how light or how dark something is. And this is again time. And so we, we put in a phase perturbation here, which is a perturbation in the velocity potential, and we let it go. Then these trajectories uh, of, of our st straight line moving particles now become um, constant phase trajectories. We get again uh, a point of, of shell crossing. And now afterwards we get multi-streaming. And what is multi-streaming? It's of course uh, interference patterns because interference is just something comes from multiple origins. If you want, right? Think of the double slit. You don't know which slits it came from. That's uh, multi-streaming if you want. So here we have multi-streaming uh, in the same sense that before we had um, trajectories of particles coming from multiple regions coming together in one point. It's the same thing here. And now we get an interference pattern. But prior to, um, prior to uh, the shell crossing event, in fact, uh, this agrees extremely well with uh, sort of which this has already been noticed by Peter Cole's uh, and collaborators in, in the mid 2000s. So if you if you plot here the density um, of the Zelovich solution in 1D uh, against this, this free propagator solution, then you see before shell crossing there is exact agreement. So this is the velocity, the phase space diagram, and this is the density as a function of position. At shell crossing we have our singularity, which is now regulated in the in the field version because we have a finite h bar. So this cannot be infinite anymore. And afterwards, the Zeldovich uh, solution provides us with these two uh, singularities here at the, outs, at the outer ends of the multi-stream region. And in between, um, it is smooth. Now here we have this interference uh, pattern in between. So we, we, in fact, prior to shell crossing, we have something now that uh, allows us to circumvent um, working with particles. And we, we, we can um, do this at the, at the field level. In fact, one can when move this further and say, well, this 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 works at first order. That's already been pointed out by by Peter Pauls and collaborators, as I said before. But one can actually map uh, LPT to this by adding a, a potential part. So, in fact, turns out in at the Zeldo, which is the free solution where this is zero, and at first order, this is just the the the, the potential part from the second order. Um, uh, Lagrangian perturbation theory ingredient. So these are just combinations of, of gradients of, of this initial potential that you have. And in fact, it turns out you can then um, 
unfortunately, this becomes then a path integral you have to solve, but you can approximate this, um, um, what we showed in this nice paper led by Kura Uleman, is you can approximate this path integral um, by an endpoint approximation, which just is, you might have seen this if you have done a uh, symplectic or Hamiltonian system. So you, you can replace the path integral, in fact, by a free drift. Then you kick once, meaning you change the, the phases once with this potential at this interaction point, and then you do a free evolution again. And so um, we showed there that in fact, this gives you something that's 2.5, two and a half order LPT. The reason is that LPT has to by hand correct for sort of these non-Hamiltonian character. Um, um, you can ask me about the details, which here are built in because this is a Hamiltonian formalism. And so here, what you see is this agrees very nicely. This is now a two-dimensional density distribution well after shell crossing in the Zeldovich approximation, um, using this free propagator, then using the two LPT and using here, this is with a next leading order and this perturbation, uh, uh, propagator perturbation theory. So uh, you see the caustics are all nicely, all density features are reproduced and inside of the, the um, it really maps to the same thing essentially, right? The multi-stream injustice becomes this interference. Um, there is not something else that's really nice. You say, well, um, well, we have a, a potential flow. So we have this Bernoulli equation. I have to watch the time. I think we have five more minutes. Is that correct? That's all right. We have, we have time. Okay. So uh, what's what's nice is 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 that um, uh, you might worry. Uh, okay. So the particles they can have vorticity or things like this, right? Um, there is no reason why there shouldn't arise vorticity later. As it turns out, in fact, you can make vorticity in this flow if it starts initially potentially only by shell crossing. And so the what's what's in fact is cute is is that the uh, vorticity in the in the quantum system also arises only in in shell crossing. And shell crossing, in fact, arises. Um, the vorticity must be because we have everywhere, um, in some sense, we, we have this Bernoulli equation, which says my flow everywhere is a potential flow. But uh, in the quantum system, then um, I get some sense, I have a, a potential flow which shell crosses. And now at the boundary of the shell crossing flow, I must match something that's potential with other pieces that are potential. So I get some kind of topological frustration situation. And that's exactly what's happening is in fact that I get a quantized vorticity, which arises as a, as a, um, as a, a topological charge, if you want. Um, so I get positive rotons and negative rotons in the multi-stream region, which sort out that I can have a potential flow almost everywhere, except at these, these uh, pseudo-particle locations. And so they are in, in 2D, in fact, they always, I have positive and negative, meaning ro rotons upwards and rotons downwards. And so if I, I can only pair create them, um, which is which is cute, uh, and and in fact in three D they turn out to be only because uh, so I have, I have positive and negative, but in three D they turn out to be always uh, loops, and that's that's the reason for uh, why in the two D cut they have only positive and negative. So if I look at uh, if I these are then these these, these positive and negative vortices, um, and if I smooth them a little bit and I look at the vorticity in the Zeldovich solution, so I, I sort of see in fact they are indeed. Uh, located, localized in, in exactly the same regions. So that's sort of a, 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 a nice curiosity um, that that, that uh, pieces this together. So now I can apply the situation, this 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 formalism to random initial conditions and uh, generate with this um, very nice on the grid um, initial conditions for Eulerian codes uh, where I need to know the fields on the grid and um, like Ramses and so on, it's um, with the same theoretical uh, footing as, as for the Gramsci codes where I move around my, my particles. And so with this, uh, in fact, we, we showed in this paper, uh, we, we get uh, very similar results. I'm not gonna go into the details for power spectra and bi spectra uh, for, for grid codes like Ramses and, and uh, Lagrangian uh, codes like uh, a repo. And, um, um, I, I want to just use my last uh, three minutes. I'm running a little bit out of time, actually. I was preparing for shorter, but then um, on one can also use this, in fact, uh, because we know that uh, Zeldovich doesn't, or the, this LPT doesn't really uh, blow up in any bad way. 
um, even if we go close to or after shell crossing, I can use this as a forward model for the intergalactic medium. And this is a project we've done with uh, uh, Natalia Porqueres. So one question is, so we, we, if we wanted to use this as a forward model um, as of the baryon distribution, for example, this density field that we get out here, in fact, this at first order, these are two, two Fourier transforms. So you can do it in FFT. So all this might sound very complicated. In the end, it's two Fourier transforms with an FFT. Very simple to get this out. But can we, if we if we want to do IGM modeling, then we have to in fact uh, allow for redshift space distortion. So meaning, if I have a, a perturbation uh, region that's expanding in real space then it will be deformed like this in redshift space because the back part will be moving away from me. So it will be more redshifted uh, than parts which are expanding towards me, which will be blue shifted. And so I get sort of um, shapes like this will be distorted into shapes like this. Um, if I have a collapsing region, um, the opposite will be true. It will be squished like this. And in fact, I can get these finger of God effects even in this case. So uh, in LPT, one can write down that instead of an X space, which was this layering coordinate, I observe it in S space. And so I can write it like this. This F of A is just uh, the time derivative of this D that we had before. And this is the projection of the displacement map on the line of sight. And so I have my X, but I also have this piece, uh, which moves things according to its velocity in this line of sight direction. And so what's, what's interesting is, uh, this can be trivially integrated in this formalism because um, if we now just restrict ourselves to the first order, instead of moving from Q to X, I move from Q to X and then I move to S. So I, I essentially just add another path to this propagator, which in a straight line takes me from the physical space to the redshift space. And so instead of, uh, this is now the Fourier transform of this, uh, of this propagator, instead of just having um, this momentum part here, it now simply has this projection of the momentum with some time dependence, which is exactly this piece here, onto the line of sight. And that gives me uh, a propagator to redshift space. So if you see here, this is the Zeldovich approximation, uh, displacing particles around. So you see all these artifacts of the particles here. And now I move it to the redshift space, this is the corresponding result in this propagator perturbation theory, where I do everything on the grid. Um, I have my density field here, and then I propagate it to redshift space. So you see this squishing of, of regions and this deformation in redshift space. And all the same with the advantage that in low density regions, so it's a little bit more blurry uh, by nature of this finite H bar, but I get, um, I have no noise in low density region. I have no particle artifacts in any of the sort. Um, as a last thing, I can even model uh, absorption in this framework by saying, okay, uh, in fact, uh, if, I, if I were to use this for Lyman Alpha Forest, I would use, I would not observe density, I would observe a transmitted flux, which is uh, e to the minus tau, tau being the optical uh, depth. And in the Gunn-Peterson uh, approximation, this optical depth is just a nonlinear transformation of the density, so a, a times the density to the power of beta. So, uh, in fact, this is also trivially integrated in this framework by saying, okay, I propagate to uh, normal space, I propagate, um, and then I transform my uh, wave function to a new wave function where the amplitude, uh, because this is only the amplitude, is transformed like this. So, I, in my new wave function, uh, instead of psi, psi bar, I have density. Now I have chi, chi bar equals this optical depth. And then I propagate the optical depth to redshift space uh, and evaluate e to the minus uh, chi chi bar. And so what you see here is the density, and then you map this to redshift space um, transmitted flux uh, maps in one go um, with this formalism. So uh, I'm going to just show this descent as by, by Natalia Polkeres has been built into this uh, Bayesian uh, Borg framework where this can be used as a forward model to infer, given some line, random line of sights uh, along which you observe distant quasars at high redshift and assume you know the absorptions, can you infer the 3D distribution of, of hydrogen in the universe from this? And so um, the, this, is, this worked in fact uh, very well. So what you see here is uh, you have a true density, then you assume you know uh, along a few sidelines, uh, you know the density distribution from, sorry, you know the absorbed flux, 
And then uh, you can re reconstruct, in fact, initial conditions relatively well. And uh, what this shows is, in fact, where you have a line of sight, um, in fact, it's very much more correlated where in, than in regions where you do not have a line of sight, where this, this, this uh, framework has to sort of guess more. Uh, but I think I'm already getting over time, so I'm putting up my, my summary. Um, I hope you've got a little bit of an uh, impression of, of that uh, there's something still to be done between um, perturbation theory and simulations at this interface. Um, and um, if you're interested in using uh, this for yourself as a, either for, as, as for forward modeling or for initial conditions for simulation, everything I presented is uh, in this uh, monophonic uh, initial conditions code, or forward modeling code uh, that is publicly available. Um, I'm just leaving this up and uh, happy to take your, your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Oliver. And it's quite a mesmerizing movie to, to, to look, for, look at while we see who's... With questions, you can use the raise hand option under um, um, the reactions at the bottom. Uh, first question, of course, from Asim. Asim, go ahead. Oliver, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, maybe I'll start with a more practical one. So if I'm running a simulation and I want to do a high resolution run so that I can uh, explore different scales and so on, I would also like to milk the simulation for all it's worth. So then starting the simulation at Redshift 11, for example, seems a little bit of a waste. Is that, is that a fair thing to say? Because suppose I want to get all the time evolution during the epoch of reionization, followed by you know followed by galaxy formation, etc., in one box. Are you saying that it's better to not do it this way? I'm not hundred percent sure I understood that. <laughs> so suppose I want to run a simulation in which I have the evolved structures at redshift eleven and at redshift zero mm -hmm. in the same box. According to your logic from the from the perturbation theory analysis, I would be better off starting the simulation at fairly late times with high order LPT. Yes. But then I miss the early evolution. So then I would have to run a different simulation to capture the early evolution. Is that correct? Well, but I mean, this depends on the scales that you're, you're looking at, right? So all we're sort of saying for these, these very big uh, simulations, um, it's it's more accurate to start them at Redshift 11, for example, as you say, rather than Redshift 200, right? Mm. Because during this early phase, in fact, n-body simulations are not very accurate, right? And you're accumulating errors. And in fact, we can show that the, the solution from LPT or from all these things is more accurate than anything you can do typically with, with, with oh, these, these yeah. algorithms. But you should always start well, you know, you should start before shell crossing, so before anything interesting really happens. Right? Right. Which is why I was thinking in terms of reionization, because there you might want to say that by redshift 9 or 8, uh, you know that interesting things have started to happen. Sure, but if you resolve, say, if you make a simulation where you resolve the galaxies that reanalyze the universe, uh, then they will turn nonlinear most likely at redshift thirty. Mm -hmm. uh, so you should you should start your simulation always for, well before uh, somewhat before shell crossing. Right? The idea is just that you can really actually push this just until the moment of shell crossing. Right? Not you don't have to stay in some some mystic uh, perturbative regime. Right. So, so this I understand. So for simulations that you want to run from tomorrow, this will be, this is useful. Yeah. But for example, suppose I want to use the illustrious simulations now, which mm -hmm. were started at uh, redshift of 100 or something with uh, Zeldovich. Uh, should I yeah. then worry about, you know, using their results at redshift 5 or 6? I think you should worry about, uh, yeah, if you were, were to use, uh, the, the thing is that their, their boxes are not made for cosmology anyway, right? So um, if you were to, to measure a bias spectra from this, you, you, you should worry that you're- No, I'm not uh, thinking about very large scale cosmology. I'm thinking about smaller scale effects. So cosmic web effects, for example. So if I, I, want to... I think there, it's, it, this, is, this is probably small, I mm -hmm. would say. Why do you, you're thinking of your kind of galaxy scale correlations. Yes, and, exactly. Maybe let's say 10 megaparsec scale correlations. 
Yeah, I don't think I don't think that we you have any any well, no, near this precision that you would have when you say I want to predict uh, the bias spectrum at redshift five because I I'm, I'm going to use uh, yeah. some tracer from from high redshift uh, H one tomography by the fact that the effects are small, so the precision stuff will mostly be relevant at large scales anyway. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm done. Great, Titan, but go ahead. Let me see if I can unmute you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Shukama. Uh, Oliver, uh, so uh, your uh, NLPT uh, seems to be very interesting for me because we already find uh, applications of 2LPT uh, in our high redshift studies. So I just wanted to know your uh, when you do this monophonic uh, at the end, uh, compared to 2LPT, how kind of computationally uh, expensive is this? Uh, as, well, it depends, right? So if, if you think about, uh, if you if you use it for ICs, I think it's, it's if you can afford it, it's always worth it because your simulation will, you can start it later and it will be more accurate. Right? So if you run, if you if, if one of your applications would be to, to measure covariance matrices from from lots and lots of simulations, then most likely you need a little less resolution and they need to run a little less long, right? If, if, if you were to use higher order, uh, for example, 3 LPT. Yeah. Um, I think it's always cheap compared to, uh, compared to, to the simulation itself. But I guess okay. the kind of application. Yeah. So in my case, uh, often I really don't have to run the simulation, even a 2LPT box uh, works because I'm really interested in low resolution and large scales. Mm -hmm. So, but I, have, I may have to run it many, many, many times to probably get a lot of realizations and, and vary parameters and so on. So yeah. I'm, I was just, I wanted to directly compare, let's say music and monophonic. Yeah, so if you do um, well, it, it's maybe three times more expensive than 2 LPT, something like this. Two to three okay, times. okay. So it's not it's uh, yeah, drastically large. Yeah. Thanks. That's it's, what I wanted to know. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, was, uh, did uh, Asim have a comment? He was trying to say something. No, no. I was just going to say that the applications here are like using NLPT as a simulation most, most often. Mm, I see. I see. Yeah. Okay, uh, Shabri is next. Shabri, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, go hi. ahead. Yeah. Um, We've okay. lost you. Try again. Can I show the forest? Hello? Shabri, we can't hear you. Can you can hear you me? Try again? Yeah, we can hear you, but uh, then your voice is breaking up. Yeah. Try again. Yeah, my connection is not very good. Okay. Yeah, my question is regarding LPT convergence in voids, and it was shown uh, way back in 96, 1996 by uh, Shandarin and Sahani that if you just look at a spherical void, which does not have any shell crossing problem, mm -hmm. LPT will not converge. In fact, the first order is the best. So I'm wondering in this LP, I mean, is it sort of serendipitous that it works past shell crossing or, and so, so suppose you were to sort of look at all the points, the Lagrangian points, which came from under densities versus over densities, would you still come up with the same conclusion? Because I don't know how to reconcile these two. Yes. Uh, so, so I think in the exactly spherical case, in fact, it converges very slow. But as, as, as you're sort of away from the exactly spherical, it, it, it does converge. So I, I'm not 100% sure I remember what it, the exact setup was in the... In the uh, well, it's, just, just like the it's just like a that was, spherical top hat with the under density, basically. Negative. Exactly. So for yeah, the exactly so. spherical case, indeed, it converges very, very poorly. And I think, in fact, this is the set of... We have to investigate this um, still. Um, I think this is the set of points with, where the convergence, in fact, is, is slow in, in these maps where you saw uh, before that, that uh, sort of these, these coefficients start to not decay. Those are isolated points which are very spherical, is my suspicion. We haven't looked at this yet. But okay. um, 
as soon as you go away from the exactly spherical case, in fact, it does converge quite nicely. So it actually improves for non-spherical systems. Okay. So if you perturb the spherical case, it, it does. It's not as bad. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Shomak is muted, but I think I'm co-host, so I can go ahead. You had to come. Yeah. I'm going to mute myself. Uh, so, Oliver, so the vorticity stuff that you were showing with your uh, with your propagator perturbation theory. So, are there any connections to you know acquiring angular momentum? Galaxies acquiring angular momentum from the cosmic web that one can think of here. Yeah, so that's a good question, right? There's, there's been, especially this French group uh, has always been uh, pushing for uh, vorticity being sort of at the root of, of these, these disk alignment uh, things. So in fact, yeah, I, maybe this, this, this could be used to, to see if one can predict these correlations quickly from this. Okay, right. I, I haven't doing, thought about it. But. Maybe one yeah. would imagine doing zoom simulations of interesting regions where you know that vorticity is going to develop and then ask what happens to the halos in the surroundings or something like this. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. I haven't thought about it, but uh, that'd be something we should, we could discuss. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks. Uh, I don't see any more questions. So uh, let's thank the speaker and, uh, you know, our applause. And uh, well, I uh, hope, uh, hope we see you in person very soon. <laughs> yeah. It would be Thank nice you. to come to India, indeed. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you, Oliver.